Per Espen Stoknes is a psychologist, economist, and researcher in the Department of Accounting, Auditing, and Law at the BI Norwegian Business School. He's published several books on ecology and economic philosophy and holds a doctoral degree in green economics from the University of Oslo. Tonight, he joins us to discuss what we think about when we try not to think about global warming toward a new psychology of climate action. It's his latest book about climate change policy and public opinion. And I would keep tap dancing, but it's now time to say, please welcome Dr. Per Espen Stoknes. Well, thanks. Um, fantastic to be here in Seattle. Um, I really feel at home because I'm from the west coast of Norway and uh, grew up in a town with uh, lots of sea and mountains with snow on them. So I spent the day down at the sea and just uh, chilled and uh, mm, looking forward to this meeting and uh, feeling deeply at home, even if it's my first day here. So that's wonderful. Um, so um, being both then a psychologist and an economist, the question that really drives me and has been driving my research and the book writing is, are humans inevitably short term? Are we as a species, so to speak, hardwired to bring the biosphere down with us? Or more constructively put, what are the conditions under which humans will actually act for the long term? And um, this book is about answering that question uh, based on what we now know on psychology, social psychology, social anthropology and sociology. Because this presentation is not about climate science as such, or the climate situation, even though I've got it with me here. But this is a book about people's responses to the climate science, to climate facts and climate news. You know, solving the climate problem is easy and cheap. And I saw the solution walking on the road here with two people, you and you afterwards. You slam a carbon price on it and re redistribute the revenues. Problem solved. So why don't we? Science tells us it's more and more urgent. But their way of telling us is kind of sciencey. Look closely at this curve here, the red one. That's what they're telling us where we're heading. And to get their points across, they've chosen this incredibly communicative name of RCP 8.5. And the good world, a world we can recognize and live in, they call the RCP 2.6. But this world, the RCP 8.5, they didn't call it a toast world or <laughs> global burning or whatever. No, they, 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 to be scientific, they put the number 39 there and called it this number name here. So what, how do people respond to this? Do they get inspired by looking at this? Or do people let out a big yawn? So if enough people got this message, well, then in a democracy, we'd force politicians to do something with it. But how are people responding? And I've been looking at the surveys, like two or 300 different surveys that have been done in this area. Here's one of the most famous ones. This is Gallup. Uh, how much do you personally worry about the greenhouse effect or global warming? And this is the year 1989 here. And this is the year 2014 here. So it seems the more we talk about climate science, the less people are concerned. This is not universally the case. Climate activists, climate scientists, and environmentalists have done a fantastic job. Globally, 54% of the population in the world that's more than 3.5 billion people, if this is a representative sample, that say that climate change is the most urgent threat we have. More than international financial instability and more than Islamic extremism. But then look closely at the US here. Here, Islamic extremism is the most important threat, followed by financial instability and the least interest in climate change. Asia had got it, Latin America got it. And if you do this again, the different studies, they're not, as I say, all 
as aligned as we could hope, but the, the, the pattern is the same. This study shows that Thailand, Portugal, Mexico, Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam, Colombia, all are in the 90s of concern, while Norway, another petroleum company that I... Sorry, not petroleum company, but a country <laughs> that I happen to know well, and US uh, are among the bottom nations. And yet another study, so you just understand this is not, this is not by chance, the Chinese have an overwhelming agreement that the climate change we're currently seeing is largely the result of human activity. Well, at the bottom we have Australia, Great Britain and the US. Norway wasn't even in this study, uh, which then seems to disagree the most to this question. And some people have been speculating, is there some kind of correlation between speaking English and disbelieving climate change? <laughs> And there might be uh, something in their culture to do with the free market ideology and these kind of things. But I, I won't go into depth on that because then I will be way beyond my time. But as you know, somewhere around 55%, the public thinks that only 55% of climate scientists agree on global warming, while in reality more than 97%. And if you measure the American public, it's just one in ten Americans that understand that more than 90% of climate scientists have concluded that human-caused global warming is happening. So this is what I call the psychological climate paradox. How can it be that with the more scientific certainty, we have declining concern? It seems to run counter to our usual way of thinking. And in order to answer that question, what I've done in this book is that I've pulled together results from about three or four hundred articles um, published in more or less obscure social science uh, journals to make this available to the public to more simply condensing all that knowledge into five main barriers, five main defenses that upkeep, so to speak, the, the, the paradox, but also what scientists, social scientists now know about what actually works. We have evidence-based strategies on how to shift the public in this case. But also, in addition to outlining those, the research on that, I also want to draw some attention to the existential dimensions of this problem. Uh, what does it mean to be human at a time where we are changing um, the, the makeup of the air, the very air we are living off and in? However, in this presentation, I will first review the main five defenses, and then I will uh, spend the most time on the solutions. So let's say you have a climate message coming in here, and in order to get through to a sustained engagement with the climate issue, you have to surpass the five defenses that I call distant, doom, dissonance, denial, and I had to cheat a little bit on the last one, identity. <laughs> so let's walk through these five. First, the, I, the distance barrier. What is that? Well. The distance barrier starts with the recognition that people have some trouble relating to the year 2100 or relating to the year 2050 because it's way beyond our time horizon. And the way climate science is communicated makes it difficult for people to relate that distant future to the here and now situation. Secondly, climate change has been communicated typically through images of melting glaciers, Arctic ice, Antarctic ice shelves, cyclones in the Pacific, floods in the Bangladesh, drowning polar bears, anything but humans. So it's very distant, it's away from us. And then if there are humans there, they're typically distant socially. This is from the Hanyan um, cyclone in the Philippines. And um, I don't know these people, I don't know anybody who knows them. And the longer the social distance, the less the empathy. Psychologists know this, back from the Milgram research. Fourthly, People responsible for solving this problem, they gather regularly at conferences, like this one, the Wishy Washy Warsaw Conference, it was called, where <laughs> after a lot of noise, they end up agreeing that we will meet again next year. <laughs> and I don't know these people. Nothing I can do can have any influence on what they're arguing about. I don't understand their arguments, I don't understand their language, and it's way outside as psychologists call it, my scope of influence. Therefore, the sum of these four dimensions of distance make it low sense of urgency. 
Also, it reduces the felt importance of issue, the risk. So if you ask, interview the American public or other countries as well, and you ask them to rate these different political issues, then typically climate comes out at the bottom, way below the economy, health, uh, education, jobs, which are the typical top political priorities. So that's the effect of psychological distancing. Well, even if you do, as Obama has been saying, a climate change is here, it's happening now, it's affecting Americans today, you still have another barrier to pass. And that's a doom barrier. So what is the doom barrier? I've got a short video, and I hope there's sound now. And, um, Carbon dioxide like has reached levels not seen in millions of years. Climate change is here and getting worse. Extreme weather has wrought havoc all over it's the world. It's happening here and now. We are running out of time. So there's been a lot of news about climate change. A lot of bad news, that is. And for the good news? Right. Well, there hasn't really been any. So, we've had 25 years of what we call framing that has been used, and that is the doom frame, or the catastrophe frame. However, the problem with using catastrophe and loss framings is that um, when you induce fear and guilt in people, it does not make people active, it rather makes people passive. And you develop what is called avoidance behaviors. Like we were kids in the kitchen when we stole a piece of cake or a chocolate, and then mother comes or father comes, <coughs> next time you want to steal, you avoid that person, right? <laughs> you don't stop stealing, but you just avoid that person. And the same way here, we avoid the messenger and we avoid the message because we develop psychologically automatic be avoidance behaviors. So, um, fear and guilt do not induce lasting engagement. Catastrophe makes us want to turn away. And even worse, we label the messengers, the environment, the environmentalists and the climate scientists. Here we have a typical environmental lady. Save the planet, go kill yourself. <laughs> That's the obvious conclusion, because humans are a pest, really. You know, that's, that's what people are hearing, some are like saying. These are stereotypes, of course, but that, they are real stereotypes. Thirdly, we have the dissonance barrier. And what's that? Dissonance is a psychological state in which we do something and know something else. So, let's say this is me. I'm out there driving, as I do, and I flew also here. So it's, you know, it's a paradox of flying to the US to speak about the climate. And Everybody else does the same. The airports are full. Our governments want to pump more oil and gas, both the Norwegian and the, and the American. So, you know, it can't be really that serious. It's everybody else is doing it, and I'm even myself I'm doing it. So I might feel as a hypocrite, because we live off the oil, and yet we criticize it. We know better, yet are stuck with our old lifestyles, our habits from the 20th century. How does this work, this dissonance? The problem with that is that if I have two contradictory thoughts or perceptions, what the behavior contradicting my knowledge, I have a high lifestyle with high emissions and CO2 that leads to high climate emissions, sorry, CO2 leads to climate disruptions, then this sounds or makes a certain dissonance inside. However, human minds are very creative and easily come up with self-justifications on how to get away with this. And we have four typical strategies that are employed. First, we can modify one or both of these. I can, for instance, say, well, you know, my emissions aren't that big. It's, it's the neighbor up street. He has this big, huge SUV. Or it's the rich people doing their private jets. Or it's the Chinese, really. We're doing that. All that, and now it comes the Indians. So, you know, what does it matter what I do? That helps a little bit. But I could also do it more stringently. I could go down and start to change the importance of one of these to kind of clarify my mind. I can say, well, the evidence is quite weak, actually, that CO2 causes warming. Actually, I've heard a scientist say it's the sunspots. And, or it hasn't really warmed since the year 1998. And, you know, there's been this well-funded, well-oiled misinformation campaign. Uh, so there's been a rich supply of disbelief messages. However, what's a, the puzzle is really why people buy it. How come 
most people or many people want to disbelieve climate science. And the dissonance effect explains this, because if I start to doubt or explain it away, then I start feeling better with myself, my lifestyle, my dissonance goes away. So I can add another cognition, for instance. I can, I've installed a heat pump in my house now, so Thailand trip doesn't really matter. Or I can outright deny that these two are related. You know, there is no evidence linking CO2 and climate change. If there is, that's just something that, you know, this sect of IPCC scientists have made up since, and the leftists are now using since they uh, need another excuse for making new taxes on people. And after Marx is dead, uh, now the climate is the new, um, the new excuse or the new... So, uh, to, to, to kind of explain this away, all kinds of cognitions come up, driven by the underlying dissonance. So what we know is that, opposite to what many people believe, it's not that we get from a new information and attitude and then we act accordingly, rather it's the other way around, that behavior drives attitudes. So if I smoke, for instance, then typically my attitude to smoking is much more positive than if I don't smoke. And if I drive a car, I'm positive to car driving and against taxes, and if I bike, then I would like to have more taxes on the cars and more, more uh, bike lanes, etc. So it's maybe more um, psychological than logical, but this is a basic fact in social psychology. The fourth main defense has been maybe somewhat overused, uh, the denial message. The point here is that uh, it, denial is not a pejorative, even though you might be used that way. You know, they are the deniers. They are denying all these things. Um, however, denial is really a quite common psychological state, which means that we can both know something and not know something at the same time. We have this capacity of dual states in ourselves. And we think we should lend some empathy to that, because really taking to heart, for instance, the knowledge that, you know, in the next lifetime of one child, maybe my child born today, when he or she is old, um, she will be living in a planet that's warmer than in the last 800,000 to 3 million years. And it's because of the, our lifestyles. So how do you really relate to that? And the point is, people have this need to protect themselves a little bit. And denial is a basic human capacity. We do it all the time. Um, and there's always denial going on in a culture. For instance, we have both a passive and an active version of denial, and it comes in both individual and a cultural context. So you can have a denial which is just simply ignoring passive and individual, but also um, the, the cultural level, we agree not to speak about this issue, or certain parts of the culture agree that we should ridicule this actively, or you finally have uh, this, this source of outspoken denialism, which I call it, which is the ideology of maintaining um, current social contract. And I found this very fresh quote here from a guy you all know, of course. Uh, the alarmists got it all wrong because, you know, sadly, died, sadly data demonstrates for that for the last 17 years there's been zero warming. And of course, this is um, completely wrong on a factual level, but our need, we need to understand this is really a way to maintain a social contract. Denial is not just stupid ignorance or being immoral. It is a social contract that we agree what to speak about and what not to speak about. And thus, it's a cultural art artifact. And as Stanley Cohen says, it's not strange that we shut out things, but why do we ever not shut out? How come we sometimes really open our eyes? And the real problem is to discover the conditions under which information is acknowledged and acted upon. And this is what I'm going to answer in my solution sections. So briefly then, this final a fifth barrier, if you get through distance, doom, dissonance and denial, we get into the identity barrier. And what is that? Well, this has to do with our sense of self, our self-esteem, our values, who we are, and um, one common way to express this, both in Norway and the US, is through our cars, for instance. So I found this video to illustrate this point. Um, now, let's say you have a proper car, I mean an SUV with diesel engine and the, the right size. And then comes this Enviro guy up in a Prius just behind you. Or you have an electric car, whatever. Even worse. And <laughs> kind of pushing into your bumper. What happens? Well, right now, 
you can buy uh, something called rolling coal. It's just five hundred dollars. Then, if you have this, you know, bothering Prius here behind you, um, you now can install a um, um, system where you can press the button to inject extra diesel into your engine. And what happens is that I press this button, and I have a whole beautiful cloud of diesel suit coming out to get rid of him. So I can. It's called a Prius repellent. <laughs> Have a good one. <laughs> we got him. So this is quite common way to protect your sense of identity against your outgroup, your enemies, and those are the others. Um, so we get this us versus them identity games. And the problem is that it doesn't just apply to certain people with big SUVs, it also applies to very smart, well-educated people, because some be like to believe that the more information we put out, the more um, people will come to their senses. So the more science intelligence you have, the more right you will get it. This is the, is the Earth getting warmer, A, mostly because of human activity, or B, mostly because of natural patterns in the Earth's environment. And the interesting thing here is that liberals will get this with higher intelligence and science knowledge, you'll get it more right more quickly. However, if you're a conservative, then the more science intelligence you have, the more wrong you will get this answer. Because you employ your entire intelligence and knowledge to reinterpret the facts in a way that doesn't threaten my identity. So this has been well established, and just look up the references if you're interested in this kind of study. So enough about the barriers. Let me focus on the solutions for the rest of the time. How do we break through these defenses, or maybe even just bypass them? And if you, who are here tonight, actually want to do something, why not spend your efforts on working in ways that we know actually works? And this is the new climate communication toolbox. So, first of all, we have a social strategy, we have a simple actions strategy, we have a supportive framing strategy, we have a better storytelling strategy and better signals or feedback strategy. With a combination of these five, we can, across, we can cross the ideological divide and we don't have to worry about dissonance and denial because these are the ways that actually work according to the social science on this. Let me go through them. First, we don't need more reports. I mean, the rational fact approach has been overextended. And we don't need more glaciers. We need human faces. We need the social touch to this. We have to use social norms, social media, and social networks. What is this? Well, let me do a few examples. This is from a Norwegian city called Bergen. Um, and they have created a community there. It's part of the Transition Town movement. And their motto is, from protest to party, or even better in Norwegian maybe, fra protest till fest. And each time there's something happening, they throw a climate party. So, you know, it's a, it's a sports event, they do a party and have some fun around it. If there is, um, um, uh, if it's spring, they take out the bikes and then they help each other to repair the bikes. If it's autumn, it's the harvesting together. So they do all these kinds together. And actually, the real estate prices in that part of the town has gone up because they see that the quality of life here has more attractiveness to it. The social capital has benefited from it. And that spills over into the economic value of things. So, more community, more collaboration, more fun and cool. That's the whole idea. Because if you look at how social change happens, it's kind of often through contagious social norms. So, we have new studies now that's showing that if one house in a neighborhood gets solar panel, the likelihood, statistically speaking, of the other houses getting it is way beyond the average of houses in, a, in an area. So the closer you are to somebody has done it, the more you want to do it. It's contagious. And one study that actually teased it out very clearly was done by Bob Cialdini, a marketing professor of psychology. He took hundreds of households and put them into one of four conditions. The first households were told they should conserve power for the sake of sustainability and for the earth being good. The second were told you should conserve power because of it's good for your grandchildren and future generations. The third group, we're told, well, it's profitable. You'll cut your power bill. The fourth group, 
were told how much they used to compare to their neighbors. And which of these groups would you guess had the highest de decline or the best conservation? Yeah, you guessed it. Yeah, you're right. Consistently, statistically significant, the most powerful effect is when you can compare this to your neighbors. So this has been commercialized by a company called Opower. You, I hope you've heard of it. I hope this is spreading now. And this is you. This is efficient neighbors. And if I do well, I get two smileys over there. And if I'm below average, I don't get um, any frowns. <laughs> but I don't get any smiles either. So the whole point is that people just don't just want to conserve energy. They want to be acknowledged for conserving energy. That's the social driver. That's where we tap into the deep evolutionary power of imitation and status in our makeup. That's why this is so effective. And of course, now when OPAR is successful, then you have copycats such as WaterSmart, which is now introducing this exact same principle in the California for water conservation. We know this works. It will work. So to sum this up, more examples. Um, you can use, the whole point is to change the messenger to somebody who's closer to your, the target group. For instance, if you want to attract broad public audiences, why not use sports stars, such as Green Sports Alliance is currently doing. You might have heard of them. They are now recruiting baseball games, uh, football, soccer, ice hockey, etc. And they're um, greening these sports events so that everybody who sees the sports stars um, behave green will want to copy them. And then you have the Green Faith Organizations, and, and I don't know how, this, how it is in the US, but at least in Norway, the unions are now coming on board. So the unions are taking on environmental and climate as one of their issues. So the whole point, the solutions to the climate are not individual actions alone, but it is social and structural through bottom-up support. That's why we're doing this. Second major strategy is to make it simpler for people to act climate-friendly. And this is where the science of behavioral economics comes in. And also, I think there's a, a guy coming in later tonight who's going to speak about um, making it cool and um, fun. And this is how we can also apply simple principles to change people's economic behavior. The simplest example I know to demonstrate this is using the power of defaults. If, for instance, you took all the printers in the US and had the such default two-sided printing, that would lead to about 15 to 20 percent less paper use or the, the similar to drawing 150,000 cars off the road every year. Um, one study we did in Norway was that we replaced the price tag on um, these uh, dry tumblers and washing machines and air conditioners with a life cycle price. And I'll show, play you a short video to get this point across. Now you see how it, how it works. Here's the story of our first green nudge. It's the story of how we can change customer behaviour to the benefit of everyone. A story of how better energy labelling can help European consumers save the environment and money at the same time. We know people have a tendency to underestimate the total cost of things they buy. When buying a car, we focus on its sales price rather than its yearly gas expenses. Most people never consider buying the most expensive tumble dryer in the store, even if it will be the cheapest in use at home. We wanted to test if people would buy more energy-efficient appliances if they knew the total lifetime costs. This is what we did. We teamed up with Elsherp, the biggest electronics retailer in Scandinavia, to see if scientists from Cicero could nudge customers to buy greener tumble dryers. The Elsherp staff were specially trained to inform customers on energy costs. We taught them that the cheapest dryer might end up more expensive in the long run compared to a higher-priced yet more energy-efficient one. Then, next to the regular price tags and the EU energy labels, we added these, showing the electricity costs for 10 years of normal use. This allowed the staff and customer to add up the total lifetime cost of the appliance. The results were astounding. A simple equation can indeed make people choose differently. The new information made customers buy dryers that use 5% less energy. 5%? That doesn't sound much, does it? If applied in all EU countries, it could save more than 10 million tonnes of CO2 every year. And how much is 10 million tonnes of CO2? It's the same as the exhaust of 2 million cars, or 
the entire CO2 production of countries such as Kenya or Luxembourg. We believe every store in Europe should start doing this. Why wouldn't they? The retailers get to sell higher priced products, the environment benefits, and this time the consumers save money too. You see, green is good for everyone. All it takes is a nudge. So there are lots of cases where we can apply these principles to make people move away from what we call mindless and wasteful behaviors to mindless and constructive behaviors. <laughs> and one example is to introduce, for instance, a default to introduce um, uh, a carbon offset on these streams with, with small fonts at the bottom of the fifth page. So you can't see it, but I introduced a little change here. Check here to not pay your carbon offsets. In this way, you flip it over from opting in to opting out. And that typically has the effect of changing behavior of more than 50% of the population. So it's using choice design to make it much simpler for people to take climate-friendly action. I could say much more about that, but I want to get in um, and have Q&A. So the third solution, in addition to making it social and making it more simple, we need to make more use of supportive frames. I talked about the doom frame, which is unhelpful. The cost frame is also unhelpful. However, helpful frames are now well identified, and there are, I'll mention three of them. The first is health framing. We should talk really more about climate as a health issue. So rather than having climate here and health in the background, we should flip it around. So we have health in the foreground and then uh, climate in the background. Because this, this is a pollen allergy, and we know with increasing CO2 that pollen goes exponentially up. So we're heading towards a world of much more pollen allergies if we uh, don't take action. And also heat-related stresses, heat-related violence, heat-related heart stroke, uh, all these things, we could talk more about, if you want, in a media language, what's killing me today? Is it ticks, or is it you know, heat wave, or is it the, the, uh, the air uh, respiratory diseases? And actually, this is now a framing that has been starting to be starting to be used. So this month or later, Obama is calling for a health and climate conference at the White House with the U.S. Surgeon General. So. Here's an example of where this practice, because it's demonstrated effective in the social sciences, it's now been picked up by the policy people. The other frame I want to mention is the insurance framing. Uh, because everybody has a fire insurance. Do we have that because we believe that our house will burn down? No. We have it because it might happen, and it's just plain, prudent, common sense to have it. Uh, so using the same framing for climate, why don't we have a climate insurance? The same way we have a fire and theft insurance and a defense as a security insurance. And this is just plain simple risk management. And uh, a bipartisan team, including Hank Paulson and Tom Steyer, put out a report last year where they talk about the risky business of continuing without taking out a climate insurance of our own. So this makes sense to a uh, defense audience, an insurance audience, minor audience, and politicians, and also co the commercial world. Then, thirdly, maybe the most important frame to use, which is growing very rapidly these days, in the last two years, is to use opportunity framing. Because climate change is not about catastrophe in the future, it is really about how we change our society in good ways right now. And what drew a lot of attention, just Yes, the, last year was the solar roadways that you might have heard of. I use it as an example because people love hearing about opportunities and they put more dollars into this um, crowdsourced, crowdfunding project than any other in history because it seems attractive to have smarter roads the same way we have smartphones, smart houses, smart buildings, etc. So we need more of these and I love the attention that when Tesla went, uh, it's just a battery, but when Tesla does it, woo, it goes viral, you know, because people like to hearing about opportunities. And the same way we have the, the Nest uh, hype that uh, Google is doing. So 
just keeps talking about opportunities, opportunities, because that brings people on board, makes a positive um, gist feeling, and that connects also with the more longer term story we need to be able to tell of where we're taking our societies. So in order to bridge the ideological divide, we also need to be speaking more of um, the positive effects on the economy. Climate change is probably uh, the biggest opportunity to restructure our, econo our economic system ever. So what we need is smarter and green growth, which then replaces the suicidal growth that we had in the previous century. Why would you do this? Well, because it's profitable today. Lots of examples showing that from anywhere from Ikea to Apple to, um, to um, uh, yeah, endless Unilever is a, is a classic one. Um, and also because it's much more expensive to continue as today. And just using the metaphor, remember the Stone Age? Well, it didn't end because there was a lack of stones. <laughs> and people talking about you know, the Petroleum Age won't end because there's a lack of oil, but like in the Stone Age, we find smarter ways of doing stuff. And now we're finding a much smarter way of doing oil, uh, getting what we need without the oil. So, you know, oil and petroleum is just so 20th century. <laughs> and making this turnaround happen, which is inevitable and is accelerating, is the biggest business opportunity in this century. And more and more business people are recognizing this, and even McKinsey is now pushing up books, with, which is called the Resource Revolution. And of course, smart investors have already placed their bets. Warren Buffett, $30 billion already and more to go. And Elon Musk, of course, has uh, been shaping up the car in industry with his initiatives. So what we need to tell is stories of deep structural transformation of our society, which increases our quality of life and at the same time reduce, reduces the ecological footprint. And then we need signals to, to kind of follow this up. Uh, one a Norwegian bank is now doing a new project where you will have, in addition to your bank account statement, you will get a printout of your CO2 impact based on your bank statement, because you can calculate that from the petroleum. So you would have that signals each month, or as often you go into your internet bank, you can see that. And also, we need to break down these huge climate signals and the PPM levels and the sea level rise to, to operational units that we can be relate to. And one way of doing this is to cut our CO2 emissions by 2% per year. If we do that, then we solve the global problem. It's fully possible to do that, and it's even profitable. So there are lots of examples of companies now growing their value added or gross profits while reducing their CO2. And this gives a very clear signal that what is green enough. If you have more than 5% reduction in the gross profits divided by your emissions per year, then you're a truly green company. If you're 4%, you're greenish, and if you're 3 you you're greenwashing. So one Norwegian company that does this yearly is Tumra. They reduce their emissions while increasing their economic value added. So I'll then conclude by some going back to the question I started up with. Are humans inevitably short term? In terms of climate issue, it might look that way. And lots of friends will become quite cynical. However, this is based on a wrong understanding of human nature, because we, what we do know is that rational facts are insufficient to create lasting engagement. And if, however, we put conducive conditions in place, social norms, supportive frames, simple action, better stories and signals, then humans will act for the long term. So this means individual actions do not solve the climate problem as such, but we do, what it does do is build bottom-up support for the structural change needed. And these positive options I've been talking about are sufficient. However, sometimes we feel that our actions are not sufficient. And there's a wonderful website out there now called Is This How You Feel? 
I just mention this because in the end of my book, I also look into the deep feelings of grief and despair that sometimes fills us, all of us that work with this issue, and we need to be able to relate to that um, and actually express that as such without running away into a forced optimism. So while we work, we also need to take care of our emotions and not burn out, because really going through that helps us to connect at a deeper level to the earth, the sea, the land. And um, more about this, however, in, um, in the book. And um, I would like to end here. Thank you for attention so far. Um, it seems that, the, that, your, that your model, not only uh, your, your discussion, not only applies to climate change, but another area where it may apply even, even in, to a greater extent is, the, uh, is in the area of uh, controlling our population. At least with climate change, we can talk about the issue, but in terms of population control, we can't even bring the issue up. I was interested in your comments on that. Thanks. Should we do more questions, Ashley? Or answer it one, one at a time. Yeah. So thanks for bringing up the Im Im amazingly important population issue. And I have good news for you. It's being solved. Why? Because hum women all over the world are getting better education, and that's probably the most important climate policy initiative we can do. Combined with quicker urbanization, all over the world the birth rate is falling quickly. And my dear colleague Jürgen Randers, who made Limits to Growth, now predicts that we will never be more than 8.1 to 3 billion people on the planet because the birth rate is sinking so quickly thanks for the combined forces of urbanization with women's education. And you're right, it's been an issue that's been difficult to address. So it's also been part of the denial. So. Uh, th thank you. I think I really enjoyed your uh, presentation. Uh, I have a couple of uh, things I would like you to comment on, please. Oh, my God. Uh, one of them is when we talk about climate change, we tend to talk only about uh, getting warmer and CO2. But here in Washington State, for example, we have uh, a place called Hanford where we have depleted uranium uh, stored in tanks underground and is now leaking that actually a famous physicist, physicist who sat here a few months ago said that we should actually not eat fish from the Columbia River because the pollution has become high enough mm. to cause diseases. And I think that's a long-term disaster, but we are very good in America here at uh, turning our faces away from real, like exactly the pictures you mm. uh, that's The same defense mechanism as Yeah, far, exactly. Yeah. We are very good at that, yeah. Uh, the other thing is, uh, uh, I don't know if you have heard about that or not, but in uh, Colorado, uh, a number of years ago, the biggest fire ever in the history of the state happened, and the reason was uh, actually one of the rangers who was supposed to protect the park from fire. She herself wanted to start a fire and then put it out so that the local papers would write an article about her as a hero. Unfortunately, actually, the fire got out of control and it ended up being the biggest ever fire in the history of the state. In America here, the season is starting now with the wildfires and actually they are not wild because most of them are from smokers or campers mm. that leave. How, as a psychologist, how you deal with those individuals actually who cause these huge disasters just for an idiotic, simple, self-centered behavior? Mm. <laughs> well, thanks. Well, we have therapy for that. Um, or as some do in Europe, they take their aeroplane and fly it into the mountain because uh, they find that an effective way of killing themselves and others. Um, so there are crazies, we have our share in Norway as well. Uh, and um, of course, having a, a, a culture which um, allows for larger diversity of self-expression and also through the arts and language is a general way of containing some of that. But you can't never contain the, the, the madness of the human uh, individual completely. And as to your nuclear leakage point of view, I think it's very important to mention, and we must remember that um, nuclear energy, relatively speaking, is much safer than uh, what we're, the experiment we're doing with the climate change right now. 
So it, it's, it's, it's CO2 is actually more dangerous than the nuclear. But that's, that's my opinion on this. Okay, please. I'm uh, personally working very hard on framing the health effects, the personal and public health effects of climate uh, as the message. And I'm, I'm a little worried, you presented that as, hey, that's a story, but I'm worried about that degenerating into more doom. How do, how do I, when I'm getting my message out, how do I make it not be doom? Mm. Uh, I think you do that by telling um, the stories of individual uh, diseases, individual um, uh, plights, how this plays out, and making it personal. So um, you don't talk about the long-term future, but you talk about these uh, this suffering that's actually happening today and giving it an individual face like I tried to illustrate with this extreme pollen uh, eyes that I showed you. So we don't have to add that everybody will have Lyme disease or everybody will have pollen allergies in the future if this continues, but we can focus on what's happening here and now with it. And that helps break the distance barrier, I think. Um, I'm working on a, a very large project, a national project, to tell stories about wow. um, the work that we're doing, um, uh, the work these uh, 50 communities are doing to address environmental issues. And um, I'm a communications director. Everybody's turning to me and saying, hey, yeah. tell their story. And one of the biggest questions I have is, how do we do that effectively? Not only how do we frame it, which is the discussion that you were having and I'd love to hear more about, but good Lord, we're all so overwhelmed with mm. stories and information and people, things coming at you, you know, left and right. Are there any particular media that you think are more effective than others or more helpful than others and more convincing than others? to tell these Me kinds of stories. The media. Well, about. media, I mean, in terms the channel. of... channel. Yeah, you were talking about social networks, social media, these things. Mm. I, I, again, we're just so overwhelmed with information. Mm. Are there particular channels that are going to make people sit up and listen? Mm. Well, thanks. Um, I don't think there is one right story to tell. Uh, Part of my mission, I think, is to um, get people out of the one story that has dominated us, and that is the one, if we continue as today, then we'll all burn in hell, which is a very deeply Christian story we've had. Uh, so in my book, I suggest at least four different archetypal basic stories, and one is the one of um, smarter growth that I talk about. The second is one of increasing happiness, because the old growth doesn't create happiness, so a quality of life story, and the ha positive psychology that builds on that. The third story is this, the now uh, faith-based stewardship story, where um, both from an ethical point of view and from a religious point of view, we are um, doing the will of God or doing a long-term ethical effort when we align our actions with long-term values. And the fourth is a story that speaks very also to nature-loving people, which is the rewilding story, how we can have a flourishing country, a flourishing um, society along with um, a flourishing nature around us. And then that's the basic narrative patterns I'm addressing. And then your question also is, goes on to how do you tell the story? And how do we tell a story that is dynamic, creates identification with the main character, and uses humor and plot and overcoming insurmount seemingly insurmountable barriers? Uh, you know, and this goes along the plot of the hero's journey uh, that some psychologists have been studying extensively, which is the basic for a lot of these uh, films that really make it big time, because it speaks to a deep psychological need in us. And then, and f finally, you have the channel. How do you distribute that story out there? Uh, and I'm not an expert on that by any means, but film, of course, is the most powerful way to get that to a universal audience. The only thing that actually beats that is the face-to-face -face storytelling. So I hope you're doing a mix of that. Thanks. Go ahead, please. So I know you said this is in the book, but I hope you'll uh, humor me and, and maybe give a couple tips on what you do do to uh, kind of combat the sense of hopelessness that you face when, when we get all this bad climate news uh, mm. kind of every day. Mm. Thanks. So, wait, we can write to me. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's a, that's a hard one to do a short version of, but 
I think the basic principle is that you go with the grief, with the despair, rather than fight it. So you allow yourself to be despaired. How can you be more full of grief? How could you be more despaired? And what happens if you let this feeling of, sorry for the language, we're fucked. <laughs> and I'm infinitely sad flow through you without identifying with it. Because this is from a more than personal level. It's not something wrong with you. You're connecting to something deep in the earth, deep in the ecosystems that are in pain, just as we are in pain. And this is a deep human capacity to connect with what is living around us. And this grief, we should not shut off because it is the start of empathy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can say more about that, but again, sorry. Uh, yeah, please. Okay, next question. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I have been a journalist for many years writing about climate change and the environment, and um, uh, I have now an opportunity to write about uh, the business side of mm. how what business opportunities there are in this and um, I was heartened to see that you were talking about smart investors uh, investing in the opportunities involved in climate change um, and as a journalist my inclination would be to try to look at those exciting entrepreneurial innovative um, paths that are being taken by technology companies and so forth. But then when I look out there and see what Forbes magazine and what the other business magazines are covering, it's more from the standpoint of the opportunism. Mm. Um, for example, the uh, ice sheets are melting and the Arctic Passage, there's, more, there's less ice and therefore there's more opportunities to drill for oil in the Arctic and, you know, north of Norway. Uh, you know, the, you can, uh, you know, there are a zillion opportunities in making snow for ski resorts. You, you know, mm. things like that that are more opportunistic. So I wanted to know um, what, what are some, you know, three or four directions that you see the business world going in that are truly positive? Mm. That's an incredibly important question. And um, I spearhead, as I said, the Norwegian Business School's program on green growth, and I do 20 days, more or less, on that question alone. So it's, I'm hard-pressed to give you a short answer. But um, what I'd like to point out, that uh, the petroleum industry, I work a lot with them, Statoil, with uh, American oil field service companies, um, are, have an incredible organizational inertia in their culture and their mindsets. So they have a hard time actually grasping these opportunities. As you say, they typically, when the ice moves north, there's more to explore, which is the same mindset, just redeployed. The argument that actually works against this is that they are a little bit like those that built horse carriages in the 1910s, before the cars came. They're a little bit like Kodak, that before the digital camera cams. They're a little bit like uh, Nokia with their button phone when smartphone comes along. They are a little bit like the blockbusters before Netflix comes along. And the good news is that their business model is going out. And they are going to go bankrupt, belly up, within 15 years or so, because the margins are being squeezed, both from increasing cost of supply, energy return on energy investment, and by the decreasing cost of the competitive, um, yeah, the, the renewables, the, the substitutes, that's the word that we're looking for. So the margins are being squeezed out of their business and they are against the evolutionary tide and they're losing. And I think that's fantastic good news for you all of us to have. We don't have to kind of try to convert the oil industry. It's going to die by its own inertia. That's the story to tell. Is this on? Hi. Yeah. Um, I think it's always really interesting to consider the role of consumption in this story. Uh, we have this real expectation that we uh, deserve a real life of luxury, that our parents, the kind of expectations that our grandparents never expected. And so I think it's really an important part of the narrative to bring that into the conversation and to shift it from being a scarcity versus abundance idea. 
Um, I just wondered if you wanted to comment maybe on that. And I was really curious about, uh, as the final commenter, what your take on our potential at Paris is going to be. P potential? For Paris. In, in December, what the, what the next meeting will oh, be. Oh, Paris, right, <laughs> right, 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 right. Okay, good. Well, thanks for bringing up the issue of, of scarcity, uh, which is really the basic, course, basic uh, issue of economics, uh, that we are always in a scarce situation, and um, the abundance or the, or the sufficiency never wins out. Uh, as for Paris, um, I think it's a little bit too early uh, because um, we're now seeing that um, the renew renewable industry and the energy efficiency industry is growing by leaps and bounds, but uh, it still hasn't gone to the level where politicians can see um, direct uh, benefit for their own pushing of it because these industries are still a little bit too weak. However, I do believe that international negotiations and national politicians will eventually support and and hasten, increase, accelerate the turnaround as soon as these industries have become nationally competitive. Uh, so they become the source of nat national competitiveness. So politicians will push this, uh, depending on which country. We see it now in Germany with the wind and the solar industry. We see it with China, which is now pulling ahead. And the big question that I have, of course, is uh, when will um, US start to uh, lobby uh, not for the petroleum industry, as they've always done, but for their strong and growing uh, renewable industry. So it's only by building the sufficient uh, commercial and social pressure from the bottom up, at which point the politicians will turn around, and then comes the top-down agreements to, to force out the laggards. We will never get a top-down agreement that will solve this problem for us, but when the uh, profitability of bottom-up um, companies and uh, social initiatives become apparent and become something that politicians can personally benefit from, then the, uh, the negotiations will succeed. And I think Paris is a bit too early, so I wouldn't be too optimistic. But maybe the next round, because you know, after the wishy-washy Paris, we will have uh, another year and another year, and then before the year of 2020, they will turn around and then we have an agreement that will force the laggards eventually out of business but not before we have a critical mass. But that's growing by leaps and the bounds. That's my personal uh, take on this. So thanks, Ashley. That was everything.